We're about to get started, so if you're, if you're not sitting down yet, please sit down. There's plenty of space up the front. There's these completely open, unused couches. Anyone can sit there if they'd like. No one? Okay. All right, no worries. <laughs> cool. All righty then, without further ado, let's get started then. Um, let me just make sure everything's recording. Yep, everything's recording. Cool. Well, hello everyone. How's it going? Are we having a good time? We're enjoying this lovely weather? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, c I couldn't believe it. Like, we, we, we left the hotel and we're like, is it going to rain? No, it won't rain. It hasn't rained for the last two days. And literally, as we got to the point of no more cover over our heads, it started pouring down. We're like, wow, that's timing. That's the best timing ever. Cool. So thanks so much for having us. Um, it's, it's great to be back in Singapore again. I was actually one of the presenters at um, iOS Conf SG last year. I had a fantastic time. Singapore's a beautiful place. It's just so green, and now I know why. Um, it's all the rain. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's really good to be back. Um, anyway, so first things first, I've been told by my marketing team that um, before we begin, I need to get a selfie of us and everyone that we can, we can put on our Twitter page and everything. So everyone wants to look really happy. I'll, I'll, I'll hide, I'll get the, the empty couch out of the way. There we go. Off me, it's not about me, it's about you. All right, everyone look happy, yay! Excellent, cool. Okay, hopefully that didn't kill my recording. No, it didn't. That's good. So I'm, I'm recording audio through this, and it's also serving as my notes as well through Keynote. So I'm, I'm testing the multitasking capabilities of this iPhone pretty heavily at the moment. Cool. And just before I, I begin, that's our hashtag. If you want to do some tweets or some Instagrams or some Snapchats or some other social medias, um, that's the hashtag you to use. Um, it is currently 4 in the morning in San Francisco, so they wouldn't be up yet. But once the marketing team wakes up, they'll start retweeting. And um, yeah, it'll be good. Not at the moment, though, unless, it, unless someone's up at 4, and I hope they're not. Anyway, so quick, quick, quick introduction about me. My name's Tim Oliver. Some people call me Tom, but it's Tim, trust me. Um, a, few giggle, a few giggles there. I'm a product engineer at Realm, um, which basically means I, I started off on the Coco side, working on the, the main products, which was um, the Realm Coco. Um, and, I, and since then, I've started to move to doing other things at Realm. Like I started working on the auxiliary apps, like the Realm browser. And then I also started doing things like auxiliary libraries. Like um, one of the things I, I started, started was a, a small library to convert Realm files to CSV. So a lot of like auxiliary tools. And most recently, I started going around doing presentations like this one here, which uh, we're all having fun at. I joined Realm at uh, the start of 2015. So I've been there for uh, going on two years now, two, just over two years now. It's been really fantastic. Um, I actually went and lived in San Francisco for a bit this year and just came back. And San Francisco was amazing. I totally recommend it if anyone wants to go visit it. And yeah, and it's just, you can learn so much over there. I've been a fan of building iPhone OS, sorry, iOS apps since the iPhone 3G came out in 2008. I was amazed at the, at the possibility of having a computer with internet always on in your pocket and just what kind of potential that could unlock. As you can see, there's tons and tons of potential there and it's really good to see that since then a whole industry has blossomed and it's, it's great that we're all a part of that. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm not you know, working on a database, which is completely un UI related, I also in my free time like to work on open source UI libraries. So I do a lot of random view controllers that people can um, put in their apps. One thing I just released last week was I made, uh, I completely rolled from scratch the lock screen um, from iOS, the, the, pin, the pin, pad with the translu pin pad with a translucency effect, um, which I'm sure will never get approved because it looks like a security spoof, but um, it was a good, it was a good in, uh, challenge anyway. And before I joined Realm, I, I was actually a Realm user myself, so, um, which is really, really good because I, I, got, I, got I got to try it firsthand from the outside and I got a lot of feedback and a lot of that feedback was re received was really good. And I've, I've, I've been so happy with it, I've stuck with them ever since. Um, just as a quick show of hands, who here has used, heard of Realm before? People have heard of, heard of Realm. Cool, oh, that's three quarters of the room. Who here has uh, compiled an app with Realm in it before? Cool, that's still more than half of the room. Who here has actually shipped an app on the App Store with, with Realm? Hey, there we go, they're the, they're the real heroes. Excellent. <laughs> that was about, was it about 10 or so? That's excellent. Cool, so my little, I'll just do a little plug. My little app I used was, um, was a comic reader app. So I was using Core Data originally because I needed to store um, metadata. I, I've calculated about both the, 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 the file format, um, which the comic came in, like the file metadata, and also uh, metadata per page. So for things like calculating how much load will be on the GPU, I needed to know in advance what the pixel resolution of the, of the page would be. I did that in Core Data. Uh, does anyone here, hands up, who here likes Core Data? Silence. No one, wow. 
Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, I feel the same way. Um, yeah, core data drove me to borderline depression at some point cause, just because it was so complicated. The learning curve was so high. And I basically just stumbled across Realm and I, and I was like, I can't deal with core data anymore. I'll try this Realm thing. There's no way it could be as dreadful as core data. And thankfully, it wasn't. Anyway, so I'm not the only user at the moment. We've, uh, we've calculated that we've got over 100,000 active developers. So we, we have a little... We, we don't collect any personal data, but we have a little bit of analytics in, in, the, in the binary that, work, that executes only in the simulator, so we can find out how many people are doing builds of Realm, but um, that's all, all the info we get. And I think marketing pulled some magic to calculate that we've now got an instance of Realm running on over 2 billion devices in the world, which is a, a, an astronomical number. It's crazy considering that Realm is still very new. And it's just really, really good to see that so many companies have taken it up and they're, they're, the feedback's been really, really good. Choosing means no bugs, which is a good start. Cool. So we've got two, two, I guess you call it products, thingies at Realm. We've got two major products. So I'll, I'll lead off with the, the one that, that came about during Realm's inception. It's just, it's just been our leading product up until now. It's called the Realm Mobile, mobile Database. So the concept of the Realm Mobile Database is it's an on-device cross-platform object database. So it's fully embedded. It's not like a, a, a web service or any other like thing like, things like Firebase or anything like that, where it's on the server with a caching mechanism on the, on the device. It's a fully offline on-device database. It's cross-platform, which means that you can actually generate a database file on an iPhone and send it to an, I an Android. And assuming you've lined up the, um, the schema properly, it will just open up, which is really, really powerful. A lot of, a lot of people think we're just another core data, where we're just a, a convenient wrapper around SQLite. That's not the case. Um, this is before my time, but apparently how it went down was the two co-founders co of the company were from Nokia, and they they created their own custom C++ engine for a Windows app originally, I think. And then they were like, hey, this is pretty cool. We could probably turn this into a database for other platforms as well. So they actually came up with their own completely custom, I think it might even be patented, um, set of algorithms to actually form the engine that is used to save data to the disk and get it back out again. And just, for, just to clarify, when I say save to disk, Realm is, um, it, it, it saves data to disk as a file format called .realm. So it's not a .sqlite file or, or like a .text file. It's a binary file called a .realm. And so that C++ engine is what interacts with those files. Seems like so long ago now. Um, the, first, the first version of, um, of Realm, well, Realm, I think Realm came, out of the, came out, of the, out, of the, um, out of the shadows on July 2014 and announced the first product, which is Realm Objective-C. That was right after Swift got, got, got announced. I'm sure they're like, oh, no. But um, thankfully, a Swift version came straight after that. Originally, the core, the C++ engine bit, wasn't open source. We were keeping that, keeping that under wraps until um, our next product was ready. But now, as of last year, in September, it is now fully open source. So you can go in there and see every single bit of code that went into both the, the, uh, the device level um, versions of Realm as well as the actual core. When we do it all in the open, so we, we, we do discussions through GitHub issues. We, we do all of our code uh, merges through Git, GitHub PR. So it's all out in the open. You can see the awesome interactions between Realm employees there. Hopefully, it's above the belt for the most part. I think it is. Yeah, we're all friends. And yeah. And uh, I kind of did a really quick calculation. Um, basically, of all the, all the repos we have, we've, we've now got about 25,000 stars, which is excellent. And we've got... I calculated more. Uh, I went through and just did a quick addition. Thirty-five thousand commits am among most of our major repos. So there's a lot of work that went into these things. And as you can, as you can see at the bottom, while we have a C++ engine, we then create. We call them internally bindings, but externally they're called separate products. Um, so we have versions for Swift, Objective C, Java, Xamarin, and as of last last week, uh, we now support .NET Core, which means it now works fully on Windows, which is really exciting. And that's the React Native logo, but we also do JavaScript in general, um, including Node.js on the server. So Realm itself is a very interesting type of architecture because it uses a concept called live objects. So live objects is apparently a concept that happens, it was discussed in the 90s or something, like a long time ago, but at the time the hardware wasn't very viable. So people tried live objects, but then they kind of did away with it. But thankfully the landscape's changed a bit now and live objects became viable. And Realm is completely architected on this concept. So I'll explain what it is. Basically, the way Realm works is there's no, there's no copying. There's no, there's no, we take the data that's on disk and bring it into memory. It's actually what we call a zero copy sort of mechanism. So when you're actually accessing data from your code, we're actually using the memory mapped features of the, um, the memory mapping features of the, of the SSD or the, or the hard drive to point to that data directly on disk and page it in on demand. 
And this is really good because it means there's no copying, there's no overhead for opening the file and, and doing, doing a copy in memory, which makes it very fast. And when it's bu buffered with SSDs as well, that, that gives really good performance, even though it might, you would assume there might be a bit of a performance hit. But this also enables the paradigm which we call live objects, because what this means is that because we're not dealing with a copy in memory, we're still dealing with a copy on disk, when the copy on disk changes, so something else changes it, maybe a background thread changed it, or even another device changed it, which I'll talk about later, if that thing changes on disk, your object in memory will also update as well, which is really, really cool, because it means that suddenly you don't have to worry about doing like manual data refreshes, re refetches. It just means that you have an object in memory, and then it will change on its own. This is a really powerful thing when you get to, get to realize how to use it. I didn't use it in my comic app because I didn't know about it back then, so I'm still doing manual refetches. But, but basically what this means is you don't have to write any management code at all. It's really, really powerful. So just a bit of a, since we've got so many Realm users here, this should hopefully, hopefully just be a bit of a refresher. The Realm mobile database has basically four categories that make up its API. For the most part, um, Basically, you can take each of the APIs and they each have a, a series set, a set of set of responsibilities, and we can go through and talk about what each set does. And all this makes up the uh, the life cycle of data persistence in Realm. So the first thing is objects. So other databases like SQLite treat data as rows and columns in a table. So it's a it's a very it's a very tabular relational database style. Realm is not like that. Realm is just objects. So the data you deal with it as objects in your own code, and it gets saved down to disk as objects as well. And this is really good because, it's, because there's no um, conversion or translation involved. This is part of the reason why we, are, we can do, use the live objects sort of paradigm. And what's even more excellent is um, with SQLite, you have to manually define your schema ahead of time. You have to see if the database file exists. You have to go, OK, the database file exists, but there's no table there. So I have to create the table. I have to create the schema. I have to say create column name with varchar32 and things like that. Because I think that's how it still works. I haven't done it in a while. And Obviously, that takes a lot of time, and you've got, to, you've got to really manage that, because if there's no schema, then you won't be able to write data. Realm is kind of, uh, back when I found it, discovered it back in 2014, I was like, this is crazy. How does it do this? It uses dynamic reflection for, from, the, of, from, the, um, the platform it run, from the runtime platform it's running on to analyze these objects, determine the schema based on the properties in these classes, sorry, not objects, classes, and then it can generate the schema the first time you open the app. And it's really cool because, all you, all, as you can see here, all you need to do is just, just create a class that's a subclass of, in Swift, it's a realm.object, but you can just, just say object. In Java, it's an actual realm object. And then realm is smart enough to go, OK, so let me just get a list of all the object subclasses in this code, work out the properties, and then the, the, the realm file on, on disk will then have these properties, these schema automatically generated. This is really cool because it means there's zero setup on your behalf. This is just, I just write the classes, and I'm done. And that's just that's objects. So the next thing is, let's assume we've added some objects to Realm now. How do you actually get the data back out of the Realm file? So we, we work on a, on, a, on a really sort of like simple but chainable query system, which makes it very simple to get all the objects of a particular type and then filter it down to what you want. And then if you want after that, sort it as well. And because Realm is live, again, and lazy loaded, you can do things like this, where you, you say, from the Realm context, get all the objects of type dog. And that's actually a really light operation, because we're not, we're not pulling any data in. We're actually just, just getting a reference to each one. We'll pull data in if you access it. But if you don't, then that's a very light operation. But after that, you can then say, of all those objects, apply this filter, which is see if the, see if the dog is a puppy, which, so it's ages less than two. And so that will, take, so that, that will make, mean that that puppy's object we've got now, and it's been returned, is a, it's called a realm results object. And that is a live, introspectable, um, snapshot of all the object, oh, not, not even a snapshot, uh, a, a list of all the, all, all the dog objects with the ages less than two. And the cool thing is, this is something I, I did not know about for, for the longest while, and this is, this is so cool, is um, that query results object is also live. So if you go ahead on a background thread or somewhere else and do something where you, you might add another dog that is also a puppy, has an age less of two, or, or a dog has a birthday and it stops being a puppy, something that would change the results of that object, Realm will automatically update that object. There's no need for you to refetch it and redo this query. You can just hang on to that puppy's object for basically for, for as long as your app is open, and it will automatically and intelligently up update itself with the current state. And again, this is really, really powerful because all you need to do is basically do 
one line of code to get the list and you can just attach it to a table view or a collection view in iOS and basically that object can be your data source. But that being said, we now have an interesting situation. How do we know when a, when a query has actually changed and, and, and the data has actually changed? So how do, we, how do we know that we now have a need to update the UI? Back when I uh, started Realm, we didn't have anything, so I had to implement my own notification system. I was like, a dog was added on, on the main thread. But thankfully, Realm has made leaps and strides over the last two years. So now we've actually integrated an, an incredibly rich notification system, which has lots of granularity. And you can do things like um, register for any kind of event that when data in the Realm changes, you'll be notified and you can update your, your UI. And the granularity, granul I can say that word, granularity goes from all the way to the very top, so you can, you can get an event every time anything in the realm changes, all the way down to a specific property on a specific object. So if you have a view controller that's showing all the properties of a single object, you can, you can register for every single um, property to change and then update just the section of the UI where that's actually um, being rendered. But probably the most important we, one we have is um, clearly when you talk about table views and collection views, you want to know that if a new object has been added or if an object's been deleted, because you have to update the number of rows that's visible on the screen, so it's a very, very straightforward API. All you have to do is take that original results object we had and add a notification and call the add notification block method on it. And that will let you, that will provide you with a closure or a block that lets you, that will be called every single time something changes in Realm that would cause that query to change. And it's really, really cool in the fact that it returns this little changes um, object. And in that, that actually gives you granular data about what happened. So was an object added? Was an object deleted? Was an object were the properties changed? Did the name change or something? And because of that, you can then plug that straight into the UI table view API. So you can actually get really granular animations. Like you don't have to keep constantly updating the entire screen. You can update just the bit that needs to be updated. So you can have really efficient UI updates at, at basically zero code. It's very, very minimal code. Cool. So, and the last thing, I, I skipped over it before. I just said, let's assume we have data, but actually putting data into Realm. So, um, I go back to my notes from the previous slide. There we go. So Realm, Realm is ACID, ACID compliant, which means that it's, it's, very, it's very particular about how data is added in such a way that it's very, very transactional. There's no possible way that data can be added on two different threads at the same time because that would cause corruption. And corruption is very bad for a database. So it's, 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 it solves this problem by in, in, integrating and implementing a very strict, um, but very straightforward right transactional system. So when you're used to other things like, like core data, where you, you can technically change properties about doing a write, but you do sometimes get funniness, um, this is really good because it, it, it gives you a lot of context and lets you architect your code in such a way that it's very straightforward to perform write transactions. So to do a write transaction, as you can see, it's um, a little less code on the Swift side, but it's basically the same. You only have to do is open up a write transaction on a realm. So th that realm object there is just pointing to a, realm, is a, a context for a realm file on disk. Just say realm.write, open up a, a block, or alternatively, you can also call realm.begin commit begin write transaction, or and then afterwards realm commit write transaction. And that means that everything in between that, when you when you set the property there, it will then be added written to realm. And something to note is on other threads, you can still continue to read from realm while a write transaction is open, which is a really nice mechanism because you can still do heavy background processing, but you cannot have two write transactions open at once. So if you are doing a write transaction on one thread and another one that's executing at the same time opens up on another thread, that second one will wait till the first one's done. And because of this, we sometimes recommend you, you be really careful about this because you could, you could, if you do uh, writes on the main thread, you could end up in a scenario where a, back, a long running background write on the, ba on the background might block that main thread one. So you might get um, a, a blocked UI thread then. So it's usually, we usually recommend that wherever you can, you try and offload all rights to, to background threads. But as you can see, it's, it's, it just depends on your use cases. Cool. And that makes up the four categories of the Realm mobile database. And as you can see, it's very straightforward. There's not a lot of code. We, 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 we pretty much fight tooth and nail to keep the number of methods and APIs as minimal as possible. So we're very dedicated at Realm to making sure that when we add a new API or an object, it's a big deal and it's totally necessary. The whole goal is to keep the API as absolutely minimal and compact as possible. Cool. So the new hotness we announced last year, about a week before I came over for iOS Conf SG, was um, something we now call the Realm Mobile Platform. So this is a, I don't, I'm not, not sure how to, how to describe it. It's not really a separate product, but it's, it's more 
a series of extensions and additional software services that go hand in hand with the Realm Mobile Database that then really give it a lot more capabilities, make it a lot more powerful and enable a lot more features, which is um, a really cool thing and, um, and enables a whole new suite of new functionality. So the, the core concept of the Realm Mobile Platform is it is automatic, seamless synchronization between devices. So the concept is I'm a user, I have an iPhone and an iPad, I have the exact same app installed on both the iPhone and the iPad. I do something on my iPhone, like I, 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 it's a to-do app and I add a new item and I just want that to, like, and, and as a user, I expect that to appear on my iPad automatically. So we seem to have entered this, this period now with, with thanks to iCloud being so easy to use and, and Google doing Google, Google App Engine and, and even Firebase. We're at the point now where users just assume that data is ubiquitous. So you, you, you put you put data into an app, they just assume that even if, even if they delete the app and reinstall it, the data will still be there. Like, clearly this is, not the data, this is not the hard drive anymore. The hard drive is the cloud, and these are just windows into your data. So as developers, we all know that's actually a really hard thing to do. You either use a third-party service like iCloud or um, Firebase, but then obviously you're, you're tied to a specific platform. And again, it depends on the platform, but it could also be a lot of code or a lot of debugging, or it might not fit your use case exactly. And we at Realm think there's a better way. So. The cool thing about the Realm Mobile Platform is we take those concepts I just introduced with the mobile database and we just extend it slightly. So if you already know how Realm works with the live objects concept, um, learning how to use the Realm Mobile Platform is incredibly easy. I, again, it's a custom C++ engine. So as I understand it, it is a separate like, module that is plugged into the core. And we also have several, several other like daemons that run on servers. So it's a bunch of extra software services, but still C++. We launched it September of 2016. I remember it like it was last year. It was good times. Um, apparently, the, half the marketing team didn't sleep to get the, the website ready in time. Um, they got a really good sleep the day after, though. Um, something to be a bit aware of, though, is this one's closed source. So for the time being, I think th there might be plans to, to open source it down the line, but nothing an announced just yet. At the moment, this one's closed source. So we give, you, we give you a binary, but we don't give you the source code for this one. But we do have um, repos available if you want to give feedback and, and report bugs. We, we, we still provide all the GitHub, um, as much of the GitHub niceties as we can. And because of that, we have three editions. Um, but for most people here, I'm sure that the free edition is the most important one. Um, and I'll talk about what the editions, what the difference of the editions are. But just to let you know, there's a free version that's it's ready for shipping. It's production ready. And you can, you can start using it right away. So this is well before my time. But I was told when I was over in San Francisco this year that Real-time data sync has been like on the on the on the cards for Realm ever since the the, the two co-founders got together. They're like, they they said from the beginning, the database is step one, but real-time sync is is really step two. This is this is where we want it to be. We want it to be a database that isn't just on one device, but can just automatically be a shared ubiquitous ubiquitous database that that is across every every user's own devices. And saving data should be as seamless and as easy as just saving data to the, the same hard drive. Is that wind? Uh, is it Oh, it's the fan. Okay, sorry. I was like, I was like, boy, that's blown out of the storm outside. Okay, um, cool. Okay, so the, the core architecture of the of the Realm Mobile platform is not too complicated. So as you can see, we've got the Realm Mobile database still running on devices, but what, what we've got now is now we have a piece of software that runs on a server somewhere. It can be it can be a laptop. We have a Mac version. It can be an AWS instance. It can be a DigitalOcean instance. It can be a what's the Microsoft one? An Azure instance. And you just run, run, that, run, run that little thing there. It's called the Realm Object Server. And this is the, this is the, the piece of software in charge of, of managing the synchronization. And then after that, all you need to do is when the, when the app starts up on the device, the user can log into their own account. I'll talk about logging in a little bit. And then once they've logged in two devices, from, from the developer's perspective, all they need to do is just keep using Realm as is. So just saving data to disk and then receiving, registering for notifications when data changes. And the cool thing is Realm does all the synchronization in the background. So there's no, there's no, foreground, um, no foreground kind of like code you have to do at all. In fact, the only thing you really get at the moment is you can, you can register for a, a little block that will, that will tell you when a synchronization is in progress. But for the most part, it happens completely concurrently on a background thread that's completely managed internally by Realm. And so why, why are we doing this? What is, the, what, is the, uh, what is one of the motivations behind this? So, up until now, when you want to move data between devices, let's say I have an iPhone and I want to save it to a, move it over to an iPad, usually what the traditional model is is we use a REST API. So the idea is we have the data in a local store on a device. 
we send it up to the server by converting it to a format. You, most cases it's JSON, but there are a few other ones which are a bit nicer than JSON, but for the most part tr it's traditionally JSON. The server then you know, grabs the data, converts it into its own format, saves it to a database, and then the same process happens in reverse on the way down. The problem is, in a perfect world, that's pretty straightforward. It's just, if, if I'm a device that wants to get data from a server, all I have to do is request users, get the JSON, get to JSON, and then update the UI. Problem is, this is not a perfect world, and any number of crazy things could go wrong, and it could result in like a failed, a failed um, data request. Things like, if the if the if the phone isn't online at the time, or if it loses connection midway, or if the server returns a weird a weird code because something happened and the server returns like 404 or 403, or the or the or the JSON request worked, but it was the wrong JSON spec. So the app the app was expecting this, J, JSON to be in this format, but the server returns something different. So suddenly you've got incompatible data, and then the, the, the app doesn't know what it's looking at. You could also get things where maybe the JSON was corrupted in, in transit, so you got half the JSON, so you've got enough JSON there for the, the app to start doing its thing, but then it hits an unexpected uh, lack of a closing bracket, and that, that could also cause things, issues. The problem with all this, though, is this is something that you have to worry about when you're an app developer. You have to make sure that any nut, for any possible thing that could happen when, when you make a, a REST request, you, ha you, can, you can gracefully and intelligently handle what happens and make sure the app doesn't crash. Because obviously the, the, the end result is if the app crashes, that's, that's a terrible user experience. So the, the whole point of the Roll Mobile platform is to try and issue this concept by making the whole stack a lot more simple. So the reason why all this JSON is necessary is because the way data is saved on a server is different to the way data is saved on a device. When you actually want to push data up, like I said before, we have to get it out of like SQLite and then you have to convert it to JSON and the server has to dec decode the JSON to save it to, its, to whatever it's using, which could be Postgres, could be MySQL, it could be MongoDB, it could be anything like that. So it, it's complicated because there's so many different languages involved. But the concept of Realm is we've just basically taken the same concept of, of having a database on a device and put the same database file on a server. So now all we have to do is just transmit what changed between the two databases, between the device and the server. So suddenly we've cut down a lot of cruff. There's no need to do any JSON encoding. There's no text. It can even just be binary data because there's no need to have any um, user-readable um, information there. So this, this is really nice in the fact that now we've, um, we've completely and drastically simplified a stack, which is, which is more efficient, a lot faster, and a lot smarter at how it works. Um, but that's the tip of the iceberg. So all I've been talking about at the moment is I have two devices and I want, I want, to, I want to synchronize one data from one device to another. And that's pretty easy because data, data is raw and can be mirrored very, very easily. But the cool thing about, another cool thing about the Roll Mobile platform is we also expose that data to other services on the server. So for example, how to explain this? So we provide two mechanisms. We have event handling and API bridging. But what that basically means is with event handling for the most part, you can write some code in your, and deploy it to your server that will be executed every time Realm detects something changed. So if a user, my favorite example of this is a, you, a user might be using the mobile platform in a chat app, so they're writing some messages. You can get an alert whenever a chat message has been uploaded, and then you can, do, you can actually get at that data and, and modify it. So you can do things like filter out profanity, or um, if there's URL there, you could act on the URL and, and send back some URL metadata to have like a live preview and things like that. Basically, this means that this opens up Realm to the point where you can actually start implementing your own business logic on it, and you can actually start doing custom things with it, which is really, really, really powerful, which is excellent. And another thing that we're uh, looking at at the moment, I'll talk about in a little bit, is a data connector. So the concept of the data connector is without needing to do business logic, because all you need to do, because all we've, all we've got is two databases. You've got your own, your own backend database and the Realm object server you can actually just mirror the data between the two databases. So just ensuring data parity. So you can do, and you can do this all automatically. So I'll talk about this in a little bit, but the concept is we're, we're working on a piece of software that can automatically handle the data synchronization between databases on the server with the Realm object server. The idea being that if you already have a pre-existing database, you can then just mirror it to Realm very, very quickly and easily. So three editions, like I said. The main one is, well, the, big, the biggest one is the enterprise one for large scale organizations. Realm itself is really, really efficient. With one instance, we've managed to gauge you can get up to 10,000 concurrent connections. And that's, that's not 10,000 users. That's 10,000 connections at the same time. But for instances where you are, you're r r running at a scale a lot, a lot bigger than that, we provide an enterprise version that um, comes with all the features, all the scaling and backup features that you need for a user base of that size. 
We have a professional one, which is good for smaller startups who are getting off the ground. This one gives you full access to the data on the server, so all that event handling I just mentioned. And the, the developer edition is for indie developers, so people who, who just want to ship an app and, and have data sync without having to go through another one of the services. We don't give you full access to the data, but we, we've given enough data, enough access, you can do pretty much anything you'd want to um, seriously. So I've got a few app ideas now I'm kind of excited about for um, access to the data on the server, but I'll, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit about what you can do with this and how, how it works for the developer edition. Cool. And just, just one final uh, quick, quick thing. Obviously, we, we encompass a lot of features. Like I mentioned before, Realm is offline first. When you make a write to Realm, it gets safe to the disk first. And then once it's safely on the disk, that's when it gets synchronized up. So there's no chance of, of if, if the, the signal goes out or if the battery goes dead, there's no chance of the data being corrupted or lost because it was mid-transit. There's always a copy on disk first. So it's, it's <coughs> offline first by design. Like I said, we've got event processing. So you can actually respond to both on the device and on the server when, when something changes. And then you can, you can perform additional business logic for that. Real-time two-way data sync. Like I said, it's between the object server and devices. It's very straightforward. And it just, it just sends pretty much just the deltas between the two. API mobilization. I had to figure out what the marketing team meant by this one. What they meant was when you, when you integrate an API, like a, like a third-party server, straight into an iPhone, basically you're, you're tied to using that API exactly as it is when you ship. But if the API changes down the line, like if, if it becomes incompatible, you, the app will stop working without shipping an update that, that fixes the API. The point, of this one, the point of API mobilization means that you can then rely on the ROM object server to get the, the bulk of the traffic up to the server. And then the server can be responsible for those API interactions. So if the API does change or, or, the, API, or the API has more features that come out, you can actually rejig your server logic and then continue um, piping the same data down to Realm, which means that you can actually modify APIs on the fly without needing to, to ship a new app update to, to the App Store or the Play Store. Oops. Oops, Daisy. I went ahead too far. OK, what else is there? Authentication. This is a really cool one. So we give you out of the box a basic username and password uh, sign-up system. But if you want to use your own, you can. There's actually uh, a plug-in mechanism where you can add any user system you're using already. Um, I believe that th there's documentation up on the server about it. But basically what that means is if you already have a database of users with username and passwords, you can just plug that into Realm and use that instead of making everyone get a new, a new username and password. Encryption. So it's off by default, but if you need to, Real, the data in a Realm file can be encrypted with AES-256, which is a 64-byte um, encryption key, which is more than enough for health data regulations, we've discovered. So if you need to protect the data on the, di on the device, so if, the, if the, someone manages to extract the Realm file from a device, it's still encrypted. They can't get at it. And when it's in transit, you can use the traditional HTTPS TLS uh, encryption certificates to, to make sure the data is properly encrypted in transit. Real-time collaboration, as we, as, we, um, as we outlined before, because it's very, very quick. Um, there's even, we've even got a, uh, a video on our website of two people drawing on the same canvas at the same time. Because the data is so light and can be, can be synchronized so quickly, you can actually enable real-time collaboration. I believe the algorithm that's actually being used by the mobile platform is derived from the same one, the operational, tran operational transform, that Google Docs uses. So if you've seen a, a Google Docs of two people typing on at the same time, it's basically the same concept. And the last two uh, enterprise level features that you, so you don't really need unless you're actually really serious about having tons of users, provide mechanisms for running multiple instances on, multiple instances on separate server instances. So if you want to have um, horizontal scaling, that's very straightforward. And the developer and professional edition allow for manual backup. So you can easily do a cron job that auto automatically grabs Realm files periodically to make sure that um, you can restore from a, from a, 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 a crash or anything. Um, but the Enterprise Edition also gives a continuous backup mechanism, so that'll do that automatically. But you can do that on your own pretty easily straight um, without that. Cool, OK. I've done a bit of slide talking now. I've got some demos here to show off just to show how, how it works. So I'm going to pop out of the, of the, the presentation really quickly and show you some sweet demos. Hopefully, not, hopefully everything's still recording. Is everything still recording? Yep. So I'm always scared that like, the iPhone will try and be clev clever and will just stop doing what it's doing. Because um, I've noticed that, like recordings will stop if you've got live photos because it, it, it expects like if live photos are going like it'll, it'll, it'll like it'll like overtake the audio f just for that. Okay, so the first the first one is called Realm Content. This one's really really cool. This one's brand new. My 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 great colleague um, Marin, who lives in Barcelona, um, wrote this one and put it up really recently. 
So the concept of ROM, con of ROM content, actually, first things first, I'll just explain what it is. The idea of the app is if you have a use case where you, ha you have a, a lot of information you want to display to a user, but it's ostensibly read-only information. A, a good example of that is maybe a shop catalog. So, oh, sorry, and, and to, to, to clarify, it's also um, information that it needs to be updated regularly. So, for example, like a catalog. So you have things like stock uh, prices. If, if something goes on sale, the price needs to change. If it goes out of stock, it probably should come off the thing. Things that need to happen so rapidly that, that you can't really bake this information to, a realm, to, a, not to, to, a, to an app and then just ship updates to the App Store whenever you want to change it. So the cool thing that Maron did here was that he created an app where it's basically a blank container. And all the information that is displayed in it is stored in Realm. And it's, it's stored in a synchronized Realm, which means that if you want to change it from the Realm, um, from, the, from the, the, the internet, from the Realm, from the Realm object server, you can. Um, another good example of this, I think, would be a, a conference app. So let's say a conference is coming up. I don't know if there are any conferences coming up. But, um, and you have scheduling, and you need to maybe change some, um, change some slots around, or, or if like, a sponsor pulls out, or a new sponsor comes in, and you want to just update this without having to keep shipping new updates to the App Store, that's uh, a really interesting concept you could consider, if there's anyone here <laughs> thinking about. Anyone at all? No. <laughs> now you know why I decided to demo this one. Cool. So um, I, haven't got, I haven't actually got internet here, so I'm going to show you something really cool. I'm going to show you how to run a, a server off this laptop. So you don't, you don't even need to have like a server running somewhere to, to play with this. You can do it all completely from your laptop. So I downloaded the Realm Mobile Platform, which is realmmobileplatform.zip. I think we can zoom in. Or actually, I want to try zooming in. But yeah, it's just realm mobile platform .zip. I put that in my hilariously massive projects directory. I need to clean this out at some point. Um, it's in there somewhere. There you go. A lot of folders start with the word realm in there. So, and, and the great thing is we, we ship a macOS version, which is just a this, this simple folder. Just run this command. It will crash. Oh, it won't crash. Oh, wait, no, it, it did crash. Give me one more try. I'll try one more time. Is that working? Uh-oh. It's not working. OK. Um, give me a sec. I'll re-extract it. If it comes to worse, I've got, a, I've got an online version and a, and a soap here just in case. Rambo platform, uh, projects. Ah, that's better. There's more stuff in there. There you go. That's better. There we go. That's, that's better. There we go. Cool. So it's just a, it's just a, it's just running the Realm object server in my in my little um, terminal here. When you open up for the first time, this this is this is so you can see that there's actual activity happening. When it opens up for the first time, it'll say create an admin account so you can manage users. So I'll just create admin at realm.io and I'll say the password is password. I hope no one actually makes their password password because that's bad. All right, there we go. And now we have a dashboard, so now you can actually see. This is really cool because now you can see how much data is coming in and out how many connections are live, how many Realm files are open. There'll be a few Realm files open now because this itself is powered by Realm. And yeah, so we'll, uh, and now we'll create, so there's no Realms yet, so no, no users have signed in yet. So you can, users can either register themselves, but on the admin you can actually create users as well. So I'll just create one called content. This, this will be the user that will be, in, that will be logged in for um, the content app. So create. Oh, that, whoop. it's JSON being funny. Cool. And now I can even share it to this iPad mini here by going up to my Wi-Fi and saying create network. We'll call it Tim's MacBook Pro. If that work. And I can actually start running it now. So I'll go back to, let's see, go back to the code. And I'll, I'll explain how, how to actually log in a little bit later. But, but the crux of the matter is all I need to do now is just have just localhost. Actually, I'll sorry. Let me let me change it so you can actually see what I'm doing. Large. There we go. That's really large. Okay, cool. So Marin took the took liberty of, of adding some constants at the top. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain how the API works in a little bit. But the crux of the matter is we have the, we have the host, we have the username, and we have the password. So now if I run that in the simulator, hopefully that will not. Complain about Swift being incompatible? Nope, it's all good. Cool. At the same time, I will. Ah, I just realised I'm actually. Oh no, that's fine. That's okay. 
I just realized I'm recording the screen, but I can also do a movie recording as well as I'm recording the screen. Only downside is you have to look at my horrible face for a second. Ah, there we go. Cool. All right. There you go. So there's the iPad. Here's the iPad on my table. So hopefully it should be a matter of going into the Wi-Fi. And hopefully, oh, there it is. Tim's MacBook Pro. Cool, there we go. So now I'm connected to my MacBook Pro from that. So that, that's really cool. Yeah, this, if no one knew about that, this is a really neat trick. And so while, while localhost works in the simulator, it doesn't work when you're using another device. So I have to alt, there we go. Hold down alt when you click down on the Wi-Fi icon and you can get your device's IP address. 169.254. Try and remember that. 169.254. Everyone else, help, help me remember the last two. 88.142. Eight, eight, cool. Thank you. That was right. Yep. Cool. Okay. So now, if I deploy that to my. Wait. No, that's right. 169.254.83. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Wow, you've got better eyesight than I do. Okay, cool. I'm wearing glasses as well. How embarrassing. Cool, okay, so that should work. So now if I run that on the iPad, actually, first things first, let me just delete the old version just to make sure there's no... Um, did I put on this one? Oh, I haven't run it on this one. Okay, that's good. Yes, that's, okay, so if I run this on the Mini, and for the record, this is what it looks like. So, if I blow that up, I can blow that up. There we go. So, it's basically, at the moment, it's just a lot of like, the cool thing is like every single thing here is dynamically generated by Realm. So, there's no, there's no, um, oh, this is, sorry. There's no like standard like containers at all being set up. Basically, every single object here is a dynamic object in Realm which can be deleted and a new one can be added. And, not going to work. Oh, it might not work. Oh, it's, oh whoops. I know, that's, I know that's screwing up. Give me a sec. I tried to be clever and I tried to add iPad support but it didn't work. There we go. So let me just, a bit of live coding. There we go. Cool, that'll do it. Then I'll revert back to the content. That's my thing. <coughs> iPhone only? Yep, that's good. Let's try that again. <coughs> See if this works a bit better. Um yeah. So while well, that's still combined, let me show you let me show you what else is cool. So like I said earlier, I work on a tool called the Realm Browser. This is a, 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 it's a Mac OS app that lets you, and we're working on Linux ver a Linux version of Windows version right now, that lets you view the contents of a Realm file, which is really, really cool for uh, debugging purposes and for um, just making sure data is being saved in the right spot. We, when we launched a mobile platform, we also added provisions to let you, um, thank you for that, to access realms on an object server and you can actually even edit the data from your, your, your laptop to a realm file that's on a server. So, okay, I'm going to quit it because obviously it's trying to do something clever. There we go. I'll try it again. There we go. Connect to object server. So the address is realm slash slash local host and by default we use 9080 as the, um, as the port. That's correct. That should be password. So hopefully there it is, cool. And you get a list of all the realms on the server. Now we have one, which is the, the content realm. And there we go, so there's a, so the app by default generated some test data on, the, on its first run, but as you can see, now we actually have exactly um, um, all, the, all the content in this app. Can't really, is that easy to see? I don't know if I'm, is that the key, the key command to blow up the window, is it? Oh, there you go, found it, yeah. So yeah, so let me see if I can bring this all together. So. This is really cool because everything is live. Um, so Marin took took great great expense to um, took great care, sorry, to make sure that everything's live. So I can I can say I can just do things like this. I can say change about this app, and straight away that just went 
to the object server and then to the simulator. And then once this works, it would, if this is on the same Wi-Fi, it will go to the iPad as well. But as you can see, it's that simple. And there's not much code, because all, all it is is it's a result object with a notification block attached to it, and that's it. Is that going to work? Oh, it, oh, it worked and it stopped working. <laughs> Story of my life. OK, there we go. It's like my, my, favorite, my favorite programming poster is that one where the guy is saying, my code isn't working. I have no idea why. And the next one is, my code's working. I have no idea why. <laughs> all right, let's try this again. There's the window. Can we see? Cool. All right, let's try that again. So, oh, now we have a... What? Oh, that's why. Oh, I didn't, I didn't sign my tests, so I can't run the app. OK, thanks for that, Xcode. Not sure why I designed my tests, but okay. Okay, cool. There we go. That's better. Couldn't connect to. Oh, whoops! Now I have to change the thing back. Ah, um, uh, right. When I rolled back the um, commits, it also deleted the IP address. All right, let's do that again. What was the address? It was one nine one six nine dot two five four point three. Wait, A3.144. That's right. Is that correct? Oh, yep. Thanks. Username and password is also wrong. Yep. Stop. Ah, ah. Just in time. There we go. All right. Moment of truth. See, I was going to. The app was only designed for our iPhone at the time. I was going to try and stick a UI split view controller into it, but I found out that's actually uh, actually more effort than you need to because you have to like sometimes like fine grain manage the view controller stack and that thing. Cool. There we go. So we've got. Oops. I guess. Ah, oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Plain list. There you go. Cool. So let's try that again. So we've got. Um, Default page, heading of H1. There you go, so we'll make some. What's that? What was that? Where was that? <laughs> I lost that. What was that? Formatting showcase. Oh, there we go. Plain list for me. There you go. So now we actually have. So the, the simulator on my, map, my laptop and the iPad are both connected to the object server running on my laptop now. So let's see. I didn't actually test this, so hopefully, hopefully it will work the way I think it will work. So heading of H1. <coughs> Change the hi, everybody. Let's see if this works. Yay, there we go. As you can see, oh, that, did, oh, that, one, that one didn't, okay. But the, oh, okay, maybe we have to rerun the simulator. But the, um, <laughs> the one on the iPad did. That's interesting. It's probably because um, I tried changed the IP address potentially. Let's try it again. But as you can see, that's basically it. So the concept is um, you can just change data and be, and you use the same mechanisms that you would have implemented for updates happening on a background thread to come down or over the internet, which is um, really a really quick and a really intelligent way of going about doing it. Um, that's interesting. How is it, how is it doing that? <laughs> All right, maybe, oh, maybe I have to delete this one too. Actually, that's probably what it is. The thing is, if you can't, it's not really great at, um, let me just delete both. It's not really smart at handling if you change the server out from under it. So I was testing this one before on a live server somewhere else. And now since I swapped it to a local database, it um, obviously decided to be a bit cheeky with me. Let's see if this works. But I think you get the idea. All right, let's try it again. Plain list, plain list. It's empty. <laughs> OK, the data got host. OK. Interesting. Date. Whoa. I think I think this app also assumed there'd be a slight bit of internet, but I think it's okay. 
All right, so open that up again. There we go, it's the same file. Oh, I see. It. Hi, everybody. There we go. Okay, I see what happened. So there's some, there's some logic in there where it's resetting itself every time you run the app. Like, I'm guessing this is for, a dem for demo purposes. Go back. Anything where them. Store of capital mark. Yeah. But yeah, so ba th that basically gives you the idea. The idea is. Even the realm itself is just acting as another client. So you've got um, so it's writing to its own local realm file, which is then synchronized to the object server, which then comes down to the other devices. Cool. That's basically realm content. Uh, we've got one more demo, and then um, a little bit more after that, and we're done. So the next demo is realm pop. This one's a really fun one, and um, we we love to show this one off because it's 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 a game. It's cross platform. Um, it nearly ended some friendships at one point. Um, yeah, it's a pretty pretty hardcore game. Um, but yeah, let me let me let me let me crank it up. Let's see if we can get it running on a, on the local instance. All right, so let's see if we can do this properly. So, delete that. Let me, I'll show what I'm doing. So, first things first, to make sure we we're not got we haven't got any data in there that's uh, assuming it's online, we'll just delete the two instances from the simulator and um, the iPad. So open. Open? Oh, it's already open. That's why it's not opening. Okay. So we'll do this one as the same IP address. Oh, let me just copy and paste. Where's that IP address? There it is. So I copy that. I'm gonna make another user. We'll make that one. So I go back to the object server in this in Safari. Make a new user. Call this one Pop. Same password as password. Super secure. Cool. Okay, and now if we go back, just copy that, put it back into. Oh, it's in pop. Yeah, that's good. Cool. So run that on the iPad and run that on the simulator. Cool. So that's, that's loading up. Cool. That looks like it's behaving. Still burning. Oh, Swift is so fast at compiling. Everyone having a good time? Yeah? Cool. Excellent. So, so actually, how many users can do real-time collaborations? So we've we've rated that one instance can do up to ten thousand concurrent connections. So that's 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 ten thousand at the same time sending data back and forth to the server. Oh, come on. There we go. Oh, there we go. What's it building? It's building. This amount is equal for all plants, I mean, for enterprise. So ent enterprise gives you the ability to horizontally scale. So you can then add more, add more server instances as you need. But um, we're, we're relatively confident that if you, if you hit, manage to get a device, that start, uh, an app that's so successful, you've got 10,000. Keep in mind, that's not just general users. That's that's number of users on at the same time. So yeah. that's 10,000 yeah. concurrent, yeah. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's for even mediocre. mediocre. Uh, server mm -hmm. that uses real-time connection, it's not something like a super huge amount. No, 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 of course not. Yeah. yeah. Cool, okay, cool. This on the simulator. So this works with one iPad. Let's see both at the same time. There you go. Uh, okay, hopefully this is working. iPad. Done. Cool. Oh, that's right. I just remembered. I need a volunteer. Does anyone want to volunteer? Desmond? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Desmond. Everyone welcome Desmond Coe. Desmond's an old friend of mine. We used to, we used to present at the same uh, conference in Australia. What do you want me to do? Cool. You can be this, this, this gamer. I'll be this gamer. Um, I'll beat you. You're probably going to beat me. I'm terrible at this game. Okay. So, yep. So, you offered, yep, you invited me to play. How so, do I invite you? Uh, I, I have to click accept. I'm in the simulator. So, the way this works is there'll be a bunch of numbers on the screen. Uh -huh. Whoever taps the numbers in the right order going down wins. If you tap going in the wrong, down. if you tap in the wrong order, you lose, and if you're too slow, you lose. Granted, I'm at a disadvantage, so. I'm gonna be a bit, a okay. bit. It. Is start from the biggest one. Yep, the biggest one. Yeah, I win. Whoa, that's close. It's close though. It's close. All right, one more. Cool. So we'll do another request. Okay. So I'll request you this time. So you hit. Yep. yep. 
All right, here we go. What? All right. What? Oh, 20. That's right, 21, 21's higher than 18. Hard, hard. <laughs> All right, again. Good job, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh. Try again. Uh. All right, one more. Best of three. Okay. <laughs> I tried to ask Jim to do it. <laughs> it might be faster. Oh, yep. yep. I'm at a disadvantage here for the record. Uh, 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 come on, you silly mouse. There we go. Uh, there we go. Ah. Okay, good game. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Desmond. Yeah. Have we give a round of applause to Desmond? <laughs> Me dragging him up here. Cool. So that's the concept of Realm Pop. And um, I believe my colleague up the back, uh, Zaki, has copies of it on Android as well. This thing is cross-platform as well. So you can actually crank it up one iPhone, one Android. Um, and it's really nice because it, it shows some... Um, it shows you can use Realm to manage game state, which is a really good thing for um, um, if you want to make a game really quickly. But also uh, with, with event handling, you can even do things like you can tally up scores and, and, and create like leaderboards and things like that as well. Um, oh yeah, and I was going to show you really quickly how, how all this works. So it's actually not a lot of crazy code. It's actually a terrifying small amount of code. So to actually get Realm running through the mobile platform in your app, it's all that code right there, <laughs> pretty much, which is kind of crazy. So let me just walk through it really quickly. So that we, we, so Marin created a function called connect, and we've got the credentials here. So we have the server address, which in, in real life would probably be a domain name, so you could control the, the IP address from the, back, from the background. Uh, the, usually what would happen is the user would provide their own username and password, but in these demo apps, we can just create a, a test user and just put in the credentials right there. And then all you have to do <coughs> is before you start reading from any realm file, <coughs> sorry, you just you, do, you perform what's called a login operation. So you create a sync. So to use realm's default um, default username and password system, you create a sync credentials object and you use the constructor username and password. And all you have to do is put in the username, the password, and we're particular about this. If the, if the account already exists, you have to say register equals false. If you do register equals false and the account doesn't exist, it will not automatically create an account. This is done for security reasons. And so that's, that's it. So you, you create a, cre a, a cred, credentials object. And then it's just the static method here. This is a realm, a realm method. Just say sync user dot login with cred, some, some credentials. And you set the URL, the server. So interestingly enough, what we do is we actually set it up so the server, can, the, the server you use to authenticate can be different from the server you use to actually connect to do Realm stuff, to do the Realm synchronization. This is so you can actually provide your own authentication mechanism. So if you want to have your own username and database, you can run that off a completely separate stack that does the, the validation and just has to come back to Realm and say to Realm, yep, that was a valid user. And that's just a, an asynchronous request. Once it completes, if it doesn't fail, you'll get this user object, which is basically a representation of a logged in Realm user. And then it's really crazy after that. So if you've used Realm before, you, you'll know that we have what's called the Realm configuration object. So when you create a Realm instance, you can use this configuration to set up specific things like where the file is on, 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 where the file is in, um, on disk or what particular types of objects this particular Realm file will manage if you, want to just hold, if you don't want every single object from your, your app to be put in there. As of when we launched the mobile platform, we now added an extra property called sync configuration. So it's just configuration.sync configuration. And in there, all you have to do is put in that user object that you, that you uh, received. But you can also, it's also saved as a static uh, property as well. So you can say, like, you can even call sync user dot current user and to, to, to get that same user object. And then you pass in the URL to the actual Realm object server. So in this case, since we're using our own, um, I believe it's a, um, is it TCP? It's a specific protocol um, that we've called that we've, 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 uh, pro yeah, we've developed called Realm, so it's <laughs> very easy to remember. So you, just, you, you, you create a, a URL with the Realm protocol prefix. Uh, by default, the, the port is 9080, but we, put the, we cover this in the documentation. And then we even have a mechanism. We can either have a, pr a public Realm where all users can read from it, but no one can write to it. We have a private Realm, so it's a Realm just for that user, in which case you, you, you put in this little tilde here, and then the name of the Realm. So now that, now that we played that on lo locally, if I go back to the, the Realm browser, you'll see that game appeared here. So this is, this is game, and that, that string in front of it is the user ID, and that's what, is, that's what that little tilde there is. Is, um, is it a tilde or that squirrely thing? I don't, know, I don't know the name of it. Is, is um, representing. 
So now if you actually open it up, you can actually have a look at the, uh, the humiliating uh, thrashing that Desmond gave me. Um, as you can see, we've got the players and we've got the number of games we had. We, we even have the record of, actually, so I can zoom that in, record of who the players were, what the numbers that were given, who won on each side in what amount of time. Um, it's, you know, really great stuff for me to look at. Um, and yeah. All right, and I'll try and do one more thing just to see if this, this might not work because it's still in beta, but I'll show it, I'll show it to you just in, in the off chance it will work. So in the developer edition, you can actually get the Realm, the Realm data if you want to do your own um, event handling through this new feature we, we brought out very recently called Realm Functions. Um, I got to make the launch video for that. And Realm Functions basically gives you a full-blown JavaScript editor inside um, your browser, and you can actually use this to, to perform your own um, logic when something in that ROM file changes. So let's see if this works. So, so all I have to do here is create a new one. Even, even the sample code that comes in is really good, is, is really usable. So the name of that ROM was just game. I'll just look at my new script, and that's it. And hopefully it's just a matter of start. Oh, there we go. And straight away, it works. So as you can see now, so now as you can see what's happening is as, I'll do one more game, but I won't, um, oh, thank you, from cal thank you, Calendar. Um, I'll do one more game, and hopefully what we can see is as we're playing, you'll start seeing stuff updating in that console. Yep. Yeah, so, oh, I'm terrible at this game. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, as I, was, as I was working with that, we actually had the, um, the actual data come through inside our browser. So now we can actually write our own logic here to get that data. We can modify it, we can move it to another realm, we can attach another API. Um, one thing we actually um, use in one of our demo apps is we actually plugged in IBM's machine learning API so you could upload a photo through Realm to Watson and then Watson will return the description of that photo back through, through Realm again. Um, and that's completely doable through the Realm functions. <coughs> cool. And that's really powerful. Like I've, I've, I've got a few app ideas myself I want to um, try with that when I get fr some free time eventually. Cool. So there's two demos. Go back to that. Turn that off. We have a lot more demos. A lot of my, a lot of the stuff I do nowadays is just we we create a lot of demos just in, in in terms of trying to come up with scenarios that people would, that potential clients or just general general um, realm users would would want to have, so we can show how it works, and show some particular architectural models and, thing, and things like that. So I just mentioned realm scanner. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. So realm scanner was one where it, we use we use um. We actually use the event handler, but it's doable in Realm functions to, um, to use Realm as a mechanism to send data up to IBM Watson. We also have Login Kit, which is my pet project, where I've, I've created a, a full-blown login view controller, so you can enter in your username and password for Realm really easily without having to manually do that yourself. We have, a f we, we have all these demo apps down here at the bottom. Well, is the storm outside again? No. <laughs> um, so I, we can show this off tonight if you want. We've got Realm Puzzle, Realm Tasks, and Realm Drawer. These, these ones are just really quick, quick, um, fun ways to show how, how some of the, some of the um, applications of the Realm Bubble platform. And yeah. And just what, one last thing really quickly. This is, this is um, something we started adding recently. Now that we've actually had a few more um, clients sign up with us, um, that we've, we've started learning that there's... A lot of challenges, well not challenges, but like the, when, when integrating Realm with um, existing backends, sometimes it's tricky because we can, we can guarantee like synchronization between device and the object server, but then there's always the integration with the backend server as well. So that there's um, a, lot of, a lot of people trying different things and we, we found a few, few that stick. So I'll talk about them really quickly. But obviously these, these are um, changing over time. So we've come up with four design patterns that we like to talk about the most at the moment. So the lazy fetcher, the Polar, the DQR, and like I mentioned before, the Realm Data Adapters. So I'll, I'll go through this really quickly because this is, this is kind of the stuff that um, you can come, you probably, if you actually do want to learn more about this, you can come and ask us and we can talk to you about it in more detail. But this will give you a bit of a taste of what, 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 we can, um, what we've been considering. So Lazy Fetcher is basically the model that we used for the scanner, like I was mentioning just then. The idea is, and even API mobilization as well, the concept being that you have an, ex you have an existing backend API, it could be yours, it could be someone else's, it's just out there and um, you need a way to trigger it. So you, what you do in Realm and what, what we did in Scanner is the, 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 the model we recommend is you create what's called a fetch object. So it's just a special, it's just a normal Realm object, but the point of the object is its presence acts as a trigger. So basically it's like a, an, ob an object that represents a request. 
So in the example of Realm Scanner, when, we want, when, when the user takes a, a photo of something, Realm will create a new scanner fetch object and will put that photo in as NS data, or just data in Swift. And that will be sent up to, um, to ROS, up to the Realm object server. And then you can use the event handler to say, OK, that's a request object. That means the user just wants to scan this picture. So then Realm on the server side can then forward that up to the, the backend API. And then once you get the response from that, it's really neat in, in the fact that you can just write that back to the same object that represented the request. So you basically, you can put the response in the request. And that will all come down automatically being synchronized by Realm. Sometimes you might have an API that, that doesn't have any notifications, like not any way to notify when data changes. So one thing we started recommending and we found out is, is really effective is while, while doing polling on a device isn't great because obviously it takes battery and, and processor cycles, on a server it's pretty reasonable. So if you have a, an API where data might be changing but you have no idea of finding out, it's not unreasonable to try setting up a polling mechanism either in JavaScript as a node process or even just as a cron job and just periodically check in that API to see if something changed. And if it did, then you can actually fire up the event handler and then um, add that data to Realm. And then that will then synchronize down to user's devices. And the third one, did he cure? That's basically the same, the same as the lazy fetch but in reverse. So the, the API itself will then create uh, a series, uh, in queue a series of tasks that Realm will then take first come, first serve, and then process them. It can do it on its own in the server. And then if it needs to send data down to the, the devices, it can. But the concept is, the API itself creates a series of um, pending tasks that, that is then offloaded to Realm. And then finally, like I mentioned before, the Realm Data Adapter. If you have a back-end service that doesn't need like business logic, like we're talking just a database, like it's like a Postgres, uh, I'll use Postgres as an example, a Postgres database, and you just want to be able to access that data from Realm, one thing that we're working as, as a sort of a side project is the, the concept of data adapters. So what this means is, um, there's no, there's no logic, there's no like business logic in between. It's basically if a write, ha if a write occurs in your backend database, that data is mirrored to Realm, and vice versa. If Realm does something, it gets mirrored to that database as well. So there's no execution or anything. It's just basically ensuring that data is mirrored between the two containers. So we've we've, we've made one for Postgres now, which is working really nicely. So if you add a, add some data to a Postgres database, that can that can automatically be propagated to Realm. And I think we're looking at other databases soon, probably. MySQL is next, I think, but don't quote me on that. Cool. So in any case, please try out the developer edition. As you can see, it's just a download. You just download it, open it up, unzip it, start, start executing it, and you can play with it straight away. You don't need a server. You just need to be on the same Wi-Fi for the most part. And if you don't have Wi-Fi, you can, you can just turn your own MacBook into a, a Wi-Fi hub, and that works just as well. As you can see, you just hold down Alt to get, and click on the Wi-Fi icon to get the IP address. If you want, the, the professional edition is also available for download. A, I think it's a 14-day free trial, but you can try all the, all the features out and see if you like it and see if you, can, if you can benefit from those features or if the developer edition works just as well. And if you'd like to learn more about the enterprise edition, um, there's an, you can come talk to me afterwards or there's an email on the Realm website, realm.io. You can go, send an email and we'll answer your questions as soon as we can. And just as, a, just as a bit of housekeeping, we're always hiring. We need, we need uh, a lot of JavaScript engineers. Most of that stuff I've just shown is just JavaScript. So if you love JavaScript, please come talk to us. But apart from that, and we, we do local and remote. I've done both now. I've done local and remote, and they're both good. Um, and yeah, so yeah, if, you, if you're ever interested, give us a look out. And that's it for the talk. Thanks so much to Singapore Power for, for hosting us. Uh, it's so good to be in Singapore. I hope you guys enjoyed it, guys and girls enjoyed it and all. And I hope you had a good time, and I hope we'll see you next time. Cool. Are there any questions? Hey. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Sure. Uh, we saw this case when you have an application yep. that synchronizes all the data on a simulator. Yep. And the user opens screen and no, no data there. I mean, no. it's one of the screens. And there's no and, data. Uh, we're waiting for synchronization, initial oh, okay. synchronization. Yep. What is uh, the approach to fix it on real application? For example, I have a quite big catalog. Yep. Then I don't want to lock application until everything will be synchronized. Okay. Maybe I can somehow at least uh, oh, push thank you so much. Yep. updates for specific data or something like, like that. Um, okay, yep. So this was a problem that we, we, did, we did discover that was actually happening quite a bit. Um, I believe it's in the Java version, but it's definitely in the iOS version. We now have a, we now have a, a method called realm.asyncopen. So that will actually let you... Um, that will actually or notify you when the Realm has done the initial connection when the data has come down. So you can show some progress, a progress bar. So um, I yep. wait 
and feel all the sedation you'll be synchronized. Um, I, you might need to play with it, but I think another uh, approach should be you could also, in theory, um, use the, the notification token, like I said. So as data comes down, that will be notified saying, so as you can see, it'll come down. As it comes down, you can, you can update the UI to, to show the bits that have come down. Um, that one, yeah, it's, it's definitely tricky because it depends on how big the data is. Um, if you are having like a long time and it's not a great experience, um, come let us know and we can we can help I mean, help you. With a common approach when you have a server, you have database. It's quite simple. You mm. just uh, request database. Oh no, data. Okay, I request server, and they have data now, and then uh, yep. catch. But here I should wait until. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, but if it's still a problem, let us know. But yeah, try async open and or even just try it. Try the normal, the first one, but using a uh, notification block. Any questions? Hey. Yeah, uh, another question about uh, the uh, rules about sharing data between multiple users. Yep. Because uh, if we go uh, open all user database for every user, like everyone could access it. That's uh, yeah, a bit of a security yeah. hole. Yep. OK, so I, I didn't really talk about this much, but we have a, we have a feature called user permissions. Mm -hmm. So why I touched on it briefly. Like th th there's a concept where you can, ha you can have a public realm that everyone can read from. And it's, it's synchronized down to every single device for, for, uh, automatically. But there is also a mechanism where two users can share, share access to their own private realms. So it's, it's, a so it's like the Firebase. Uh, similar, very similar, yep, to Firebase, yep. And uh, right, one question. Yep, sure. <coughs> um, why for uh, Android and for iOS, we'll have totally different APIs? What? I got that question last time. Why are the APIs completely different? Um, so Realm Java is a little bit newer than Realm Objective-C and Swift. Like it started a bit, a bit later, and it's done. They're both done by two separate teams, and, and they're not even in the same country. One's in Copenhagen, and one's in San Francisco. <laughs> so as far as I'm aware, th there's there's huge, there's great effort and strides to make sure that the APIs match as much as they can. But another concern is just the way that the languages, like Java and Objective-C, are two different things. So sometimes they can't line up exactly, but just because of the constraints of the language. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's definitely effort to make sure they're on par. <laughs> yeah. the is yep. Find a solution for uh, some problem in one language. You cannot just translate it. Yeah, I know. I've I've, I've had that before. I was, like, I was like, I see a Stack Overflow question about a Java pro question. I'm like, that's easy in iOS. Oh wait, that that API doesn't exist in the Java side. So, uh, okay. okay. No worries. Okay. Yep. Sure. In the, in the Swift code, I saw that uh, there was a condition which was given down in the string. So can we use a closure instead of? Uh, oh, I switched me. Um, yeah. So that's um. So in. You talk, so you, what, what, what the, what's being referred to is um, in, the dot, in the dot filter um, method, you can use a string to actually filter your properties. That's actually an NS predicate. So it's actually using the NS predicate syntax. So we support, I think, we don't support all the NS predicate syntax, but we support like 80% of the major ones. So you can do things like string matching, seeing if, if, if integers are, uh, or if a, a portion of a string is in a string. Um, but you were asking if you can use it in a block. I think we. We have that on the, on the map. That's definitely a feature request because people, people want, because that, that means you can actually start doing things like, like filtering and sorting to your exact specifications. And so that's definitely been on the list. And I think, I think someone was working on it at some point. So it's definitely in there. But for the time being, yeah, that string is NS predicate. So if you, if you look up NS predicate and look at the syntax for that, that's how it works. Yeah, yep, at the front, sorry, yep. Yeah, Swift runs in the server, right? Swift runs in the server. Oh, yeah. it, yep. Believe me, everyone on the Realm Cocoa team really wants Realm Swift to work on the server. But the, the problem is Objective-C doesn't run on the server. And Realm Swift um, is actually a wrapper around Objective-C, because it's the Objective-C that can do the reflection features of the schema detection. Is, is it a plan to do such a problem? The first thing we need is we need Swift to do C++, because then we, could, we can completely get rid of Objective-C and just plug in the C++ core straight into Swift. But for the time being, because Swift doesn't do C++, we have to use Objective-C still. So, down the line, as Swift matures, um, I know that the second it becomes feasible, we'll probably jump on it. But at the moment, it's just not possible. So when you say uh, when Swift matures, there's no dependence on the Swift evolution. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The Swift needs to support C++ before we can start looking at that. Um, yeah. Yes? How do you solve the conflict between the two devices? Should you with the same thing to do that? Conflict resolution? Yeah. You always get that question. OK. So the way it works is. Um, it's very intelligent in the way that it works. It only, it only sends up data that changes, so you don't actually have any, any, um, any like, stuff in the way. Like, so it, it only focuses on the stuff that changes. And how it works, um, 
to my understanding, because it's rather complicated, is it, it sends along not just the deltas, it also sends along the, the history of what changed to get to that, 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 um, that outcome. So basically what that means is both devices send up their, their data and their, their actions that got to that data, and then it performs what's basically a git, git rebase on the server. So you say, okay, that happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. This is the final ver uh, data that should be the correct one. Yeah, lots of code, basically. <laughs> But it, it works really, really well. Like we test it really, really thoroughly. And we haven't had any any um any unexpected um but things yet. Finally, there will be only one version, right? How do you mean? Finally, there will be only one version for the same changes. What do you mean so one version? Yeah. Two devices. Yep. Offline mode, they change the name. Yep. One change to them one, another change to them two. And then they both come at the same time. Yep. Yeah. They're yeah. Same time. So I'm find the server. This should be only one. Right. In that case, I, you know, I didn't need to test it exactly. Whoever changed it last will be, in terms of in terms of relative time, whoever changed it last will be the one who wins. Yeah. But yeah, there will only be one copy on the server. What if name one was changed last? Yep. Uh, name two was changed. Let's say name one was changed. Yeah. Uh, five minutes ago. Name two was changed ten minutes ago. Yep. Uh, but name two came online, updated the server, and name one. <laughs> oh, I don't know. This is tricky because there's so many different combinations. I, I think it would. S Actually, I'm not. I'm not going to try and guess that one. Yeah, I think I have to try that one. <laughs> so, is there another question? The question? Oh, repeat the questions. Okay, that, that question was asking about um, conflict resolution. So, do you want me to repeat the whole question or? Okay, no worries. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, oh, yeah. I'd like to ask the applicant, how many Android developers? Uh, okay. Oh, all right, all right. <laughs> Fighting gloves on. All right. How many Android developers are here? Oh, cool. Okay. All right. Dare I ask it? How many iOS developers are here? Yeah, it's more like it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Excellent. So that was just for the record. That was about a third Android and two thirds iOS. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, I think yeah, sure. Yeah. I have a, uh, one more question. Uh, for the rim uh, itself. Yep. Uh, one way observe. Um, uh, uh, from your example, the dog and the owner. So when the yep. in the owner have a table view, um, the, I want yep. to display the, the dog information and also the owner name. Okay, yeah. So we add a notification, uh, we, we add a observe for the notification of the changes of the, uh, the filter, right? Yep. And uh, in some other thread, we change the owner's name. Will it notify the owner's name? Um, I believe so. I believe even if it's a sub object of of um of the object that you've attached notified to, that will still register as a notification. In fact, I think we even had we had that we had that question on Stack Overflow today. I think, yeah. But it should be it should be smart. Like the, the notification is smart enough to know that if something else changes that's in relation, it will still trigger. Cool. Well, I think we're here for a little bit longer, but um, so I think we'll, we'll leave it at that. But if you want to ask any more questions, feel free to come up and ask them in person. Um, thanks again, everyone, for coming. I hope you had a good time. Um, please feel free to tweet about it if you want, and um, hopefully see you next time. <laughs>